kick things off and get it rolling. Again, this is meant to be an AMA. I have a lot of thoughts and questions that I want to ask of the panel, you know, things surrounding BARD, Google antitrust, the case that's going on there, you know, obviously the updates that Google has dropped on us recently, like the helpful content update, you know, the Google core and spam updates in October. But to kick things off, I want to talk about the buzz that's been going on with the Verge article that got published calling out SEO practitioners as the people who have ruined the internet. What do you think Google could have done better to provide guidance to us SEO practitioners to kind of have avoided that potential negative sentiment that you know people are having within the industry? Who do you want to talk? <laughs> so just to uh, clarify, so Lily and I were both um, mentioned in the article. We spoke to this writer, this author, who was really, you know, I, I thought the article was very entertaining. I enjoyed reading it. Uh, it reminded me of the old days of, of SEO, and that's exactly what it covered. Um, and it equated stuff from the old days of SEO to what SEO is today. I mean, old days, I mean, I'm thinking like 2000, like 1999, 2000, 2001, maybe up to like 2003 pre-Florida days, where SEO, where we're doing SEO is literally just like spamming and jamming as we used to call it back in the days. And it's not that anymore. I mean, Lily employs, you know, ran as a team of like 30 or so people. You know, Eli works for Fortune 500 companies. I mean, we work, SEO is a real professional industry. And to, to see that, I guess she had an agenda and it read really well. It was super entertaining. I actually it was cracking up most of the time. Uh, I felt it took some, you know, hard shots at people that it was unfair, like, you know, certain people like Danny Sullivan and stuff like that. But um, I don't think it's anything Google could have done or we could have done. It's just anybody could go into, like, you feel the same way about car salesmen or, or, you know, locksmiths, it's anything, anybody, anything you get into without having like a, like a, a profession behind it or some type of degree, it's easy to go ahead and like target them. Um, same thing with authors. She wrote this article, which was well-researched, but not accurate at all. And we can attack her. So, I mean, it, I don't know. I'm not, I, I thought it was kind of funny to read. I found it very entertaining. Um, obviously a lot of inaccuracies, but overall, I mean, I know Lily's more passionate. I think Lily was more passionate about her, the, mm -hmm. that story and then I'm not passionate about anything so uh, uh -huh. really, you, go ahead. you go ahead no I mean it, it was weird because uh yeah she she I think she went after people on a personal level unnecessarily in some cases and didn't c highlight and commemorate all the things that I think those people probably shared with them that were like for me like would have been really interesting to read about that was my main takeaway it was like when I spoke to her I was like wow you really got in touch and were able to speak with so many important reputable people in our industry i was actually like as soon as she said that i was like oh this is a really serious interview like we're going to talk about the history of seo it's going to be great we talked for an hour and a half and most of the things that i talked about did not make it in there because i think they were too like uplifting and, and nice and charming <laughs> but uh yeah that was what i was like you have the opportunity to talk to danny sullivan and matt cuts and like that's how the article turned out that's weird i want to hear what they actually talked about because that would be more interesting to me as someone that wasn't what what, what, Lily, when did they speak to you? Uh, maybe six weeks ago, September. Oh, that, I spoke to her maybe like five, six months ago. Wow. She knew wow. absolutely nothing about SEO. I gave her like a whole tutorial. I think I spoke to her for like over an hour on the phone, oh, wow. like really fast, telling her how SEO works. It's not the way she thinks. Search results. If anyone are can do it, you can do it. <laughs> um, and it, I, she did spend a lot of time. Uh, I'm shocked she got Matt cuts on the phone. I'm shocked she ended up speaking to Danny. Um, but yeah, she's been working on this for several months, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. As someone who wasn't fortunate enough to be interviewed and, and flamed in the article, uh, or invited to the alligator party, my, my perspective is if you're offended by this article, then you're potentially not doing the SEO that you should, that you there, you could get the most potential out of like, yes, there is an area of SEO that does this, but I mean, Amazon doesn't do this. Like how many, like when I look for things on Amazon and I'm not going directly to Amazon, I'm using Google and I'm not clicking paid ads. And a lot of times when I talk to people about search and what I do for work, they're always like, are those the ads at the top? Who even clicks those? So obviously billions and billions of dollars of people click those, but most clicks on Google go to organic search results or organic something. I mean, Ray and Fishkin might you know, believe that a lot of things go to Google results, but they're going to organic something. They're not going to ads. So 
you know, anyone who wants can flame all of SEO and say we ruined the internet, but TikTok ruins the internet. You're not finding good stuff on the internet. Like what are your alternatives? Reddit, yes, you could append Reddit as a search query on Google, but searching on Reddit itself is a disaster. So SEO is necessary. Google's necessary. So I don't know. Her agenda is kind of weird. If like Google ceased to exist, and I know we're going to talk about like the DOJ, but it's like Google ceased to exist. What are we doing? We're going to like DuckDuckGo. We're going to Bing. Like there's a reason none of these search engines are, are popular. And there's a reason that despite everything Google does, yes, I agree with you, Lily. Search results on, on Google have gotten worse as you were quote, I don't misquoted in the article, whatever that was, but it's still the de facto place to go. And it's a far better place to go than any alternative. So just to restate, like, if you're offended by this article, then maybe you should be doing something different because I think real SEO is you know, doing the right SEO and, and doing the, the SEO that for the results that we all click on when we're actually looking for something. I also I... didn't say that, by the way. I don't think they got worse. <laughs> I'll chime in different. here to, They're different. to push this along. I, I do resonate in that, like Lily, you, you called out at DMO in Napa Valley that a lot of SEOs, when they can game the system, will game the system. And sure. I feel like the the article was written in this, you know, kind of cynical, skeptical light of like, oh, yeah. all these practitioners are all gaming the system. And, you know, that's in a lot of ways what happens when there there is a system in yeah. the first place. So Yeah, I yeah. actually like told her, by the way, I, I told her, by the way, there was a helpful content update. Like we talked after and I was like, that should probably make it in there. Cause a lot of things we talked about were like, that's relevant to what we talked about. And it's just kind of too late at this point, but Google's literally doing like they, your, your original question, Bernard, like what could Google have done better? First of all, I think Google's doing a really good job. Like I think that, that what Danny Sullivan and team are doing to provide all this new documentation about how Google works, uh, manual actions, core updates, Google's list of ranking updates, like when it starts, when it stops, like they're doing a lot to give us a lot of information. Most people just don't read their documentation. <laughs> most people don't understand that most of the answers are already in there. So I think they're doing a lot. They're also doing short videos, they're doing YouTube videos, they're doing all kinds of stuff. Um, so that was a bit strange, but I mean, like it, it, it's up to SEOs whether or not they wanna read that. And it's also up to SEOs whether or not they want to take Google's advice seriously, which I know a lot of people don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's move on to, to talk about search generative experience. Barry, I know you've been calling out a lot of these evolutions of Google trying this, putting in citations, making SGE light. What are what are your thoughts on how this SGE shakeup is going to play out? And also similarly, you know, how that may or may not influence Google ad revenue and, you know, what that means for the rollout of SGE. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people think SGE is going to change search drastically. I don't think it will. Um, right now, I think it's just going to replace that feature snippet box at most. Um, and now they're testing the light version, like we did, like you mentioned. And I do think... I don't know. I mean, I, I, I did listen to an interview recently by Sundar Pichai, I think it was in Wired actually, where he said the search results aren't going to change that much. It was just published, I think, in Wired just this weekend. Um, and search will remain the same and people are going to click on links. And we have this supplemented search by giving it AI, AI answers, AI snapshots. Um, the first iteration we saw with SGE was like, oh my God, shocking. They had this ma massive answer show up, pushed all their search results down. They had these cards that, oh, we, we're linking to you. Then Google started to experiment with citations in there. Ultimately, I think Google's really testing to see what will drive clicks because if people won't click on the organic results, people are probably not going to click on the ads um, and people will probably go away and go somewhere else. So I think Google's really being careful about testing different interfaces to see what will drive clicks to mostly their ads, but also if they just click uh, drive clicks to ads, people are not going to click on publishers either. And then people will click on ads because they just don't want to get ads. So I think we'll see more iterations, but I think my opinion, it's going to be more like a featured snippet layout where it doesn't take up too much of the search results, uh, more like we're seeing with those light version. I wouldn't be surprised if it launched with that light version. You know, it's funny to pivot back to the article. This is Google's way of addressing the article. Like one of the ways that SEOs ruin the internet, and I don't think SEOs ruin the internet, but one of the ways that you could accuse SEO of ruining the internet is taking search queries and creating results for them. So, you know, way back when it was like, what time is it somewhere? And then Google made that a featured snippet. 
or doing or just giving information. And Google's addressing that. So Google first was able to do it with knowledge graphs. So they took information that were facts. So they know exactly what time it is. They know exactly what the capital of every every country is. They know, you know, times and dates and history. Those are facts. So they took knowledge graph and turned it into facts and just showed on search results. SGE is taking things that are not necessarily facts, but they're using AI and large language models to assume that they're common and then give the answers. So they're not always correct. And that actually is fixing this problem of sites creating content just for the sake of SEO. So that's what I think Google will continue to do because that's good for users. And they're going to just, you know, bounce back and forth between are they overdoing it and the, the information is wrong? Are they overdoing, of course, and people aren't clicking ads because they need to click ads. So they fund the rest of search or do people not like it? So what I see with, and it's a test right now, it's a, it's a very small test from Google standpoint, but what I see right now is Google is constantly changing. So I don't know if I'm being A-B tested or Google's A-B testing. So I'll search something one day and I'll see one result. I'll search something another day. I'll see something completely different. I don't know. If, again, I'm being A-B tested or Google has decided that it doesn't really matter anymore. And then the other piece around this, which I think is, is very important, of course, is that OpenAI is doing their thing. And if OpenAI would just stop and say, well, ChatGPT is out, it's, a, it's an option for you, then Google would say, great, it's not so great right now as a search engine. It only goes back to 2021. We don't have to worry about it. But Google has to be continuously worried that it's going to improve. They're going to have better results. And then users might migrate over there. I think it's unlikely. Users are kind of stuck, but they might migrate over there and then they never migrate back. And then you know, OpenAI has tons of money. So maybe they make a a Gmail or an open AI mail, or they do all the things that Google does and they make a open AI analytics and, you know, Google's done, right? That does happen in business. That does happen in the tech world. So that's why I think Google will continue to test SGE, even if users hate it, even if SEOs think it's stupid and it's never going to last. I, I think it's here to stay in some form or another. And it will, of course, impact search results. Yeah, I think that those are all really, really great points. I think uh, to your point, I think like the fact that Google has been, SGE has changed for those of us that are testing it. It changes to your point, Eli, like every single day. It changes like hourly. Sometimes it disappears completely and sometimes it comes back. So it's like very hard to write a conclusive article or theory about how this is going to impact SEO when we literally don't know if it's going to be something that you push the button or if something that it's going to trigger for this many queries or not this many queries, because that's just been changing all the time. So that's why I kind of stopped writing about it as confidently as I was before, because now it's very clear that we don't exactly know what's going to happen. But I think you're exactly right, Eli. I think that this functionality, this technology will exist on Google in some capacity. And what I've been saying throughout the whole process, including with Bing Chat, which I think has always been the better product since day one. Um, I think like Bing Chat and SGE are super useful for certain things. And there's certain times that I wish SGE would trigger that it doesn't. And I hope that Google finds a way to integrate this technology in a way that's optional for the user so that if they want that, they can get it, you know, assuming it's available. But like, it doesn't have to be forced in your face every time you search for something. That's my hope for Google. Totally. Yeah. I I think I share very similar sentiments, especially with the one that Barry called out. I think that SGE, at least in its current form, feels like a, a replacement for featured snippets. But even then, you know, like with the like the small amount of time that it takes to to produce, is it really is the juice really worth the squeeze for for Google is definitely top of my mind. I think we have a lot of follow-up questions from the audience specific to SGE. So I'm going to throw out the, the different directions that people have brought up. I think folks, Drew is interested in local search results and how they are not as impacted by SGE. You know, how do we anticipate that evolving? Amir asks, how will AI generated content fare, especially with this helpful content update and SGE environment that, you know, we're, we're wading into. And then I have one other one with the impact of SGE to Google discover and new sites. I can start with the local one. Um, I think the question was SG doesn't seem to be having as much of an impact on local. I don't know That's that it. I would necessarily agree with that. Um, I think that local is heavily impacted by SG. 
like in many cases, when you search for something that's a local query, you'll get some, it's almost like a version of Google Maps or Google Business Profile, but it's slightly different. So in some cases, <laughs> you'll scroll down and you'll actually see the regular map pack, but then in SGE, it'll order things somewhat differently or it'll draw from different sources. So if you say like best coffee shop in Brooklyn, you're gonna get a certain set of results in Google Maps, but it's gonna be slightly different in SGE. And what's interesting about what they do with SGE is that they're looking at uh, like corroborating information from places outside of Google Maps. So it's not just like proximity and having the keyword and the business name and all these like local ranking factors. It's more like how many times did Time Out New York and Gothamist and all these sites mention that that's the best coffee shop because that's what SGE seems to be drawing from. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm surprised by that comment. Maybe, I mean, maybe um, it's coming up less often. You have to hit the generate button for certain types of queries, but it's been tested both ways where like you do a local search and it's just like, sometimes it seems almost repetitive to the local pack. Um, so it seems to be pretty in impacted, especially on local. Uh, but Google's like, again, testing it by query and seeing what segments work and what don't work. So we'll, we'll see. Um, but initially it was very, very, um, how do you say, um, repetitive to what we saw from the local pack. And it was kind of annoying to see both of them at the same time. What's the second question? Well, I just want to jump in on this one for a second. I, I think yeah. it's important to remember that Google is a company with 200,000 employees. So, um, and OpenAI is significantly smaller. I, every time I ask SGE how many employees OpenAI says, I get a different answer. So maybe that's an A-B test also. But they have far less employees than 200,000. And that's why you see so many different things happening on Google search and SGE. They're different teams and they work against each other. The same way there's Chrome OS and Android and the same way they're like multiple features that do the same thing. I think there's like three SMS teams within Google. So that's an interesting thing. Like as a company, like what do they, what do they adopt? So they are doing, oh, and also there's a BARD team. So like BARD is different than SGE, which is different than Google search, which is different than ads. So like all that's happening at the same time. So that's why it's weird, right? You, like when there are a lot of search results, it almost seems that SGE is just replicating search. Like there was a query I did yesterday. It was like a newsy query. And I just got like 10 news results and news also. So that's, that's I think, the local thing at play. The SGE team is solving a problem, as is search, and they end up sort of being the same. Yeah, but there is a team that focuses on making sure that interface actually doesn't have that redundancy and repetition. I mean... There is the I don't think that they team. care yet. I don't. Th I don't think that like with SGE Maybe. testing, I think that they're just rolling out SGE and they're not letting like what appears in SGE turn off any other SERP feature. That's been my experience. Yes, because it's a beta, right? So right. and that that's the thing that holds them back. And that again, that's why I think this might take a while to get out of beta, is because Google <laughs> waits for like almost perfection. So. We're in beta. We're seeing something that like, I mean, I, I've, I use Android, so I end up with Android betas and like, it can get frustrating. So Google's okay with frustrating experiences when you're in beta and you've opted in and you've signed something that says it might suck for you. Yeah. So yeah. You there's... said Google's actually into perfect, like <laughs> they wait to release something that's actually perfection. No, no, no. Closer to perfection. Closer. I, I can. Can SGE it. ever be perfect is the real no, question. I, I can confirm that sometimes Android updates kill my battery in six hours and that that made there it past the early feature release. snippets in yes. the first couple of years. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. So uh, the other components of what people are talking about with within the context or asking questions within the context of SGE is impacts on Google Discover and also, you know, I am more broadly AI content, but I think let's get into that in the next section. The other one is also around like, you know, how do we as web practitioners say optimize for SGE? I think that's a very interesting question. And then similarly, you know, do we do we have any understandings of how to track the traffic that SGE occasionally sends, whether it's in the carousel that sometimes pops up or the citations that, you know, Google sometimes gives. So much there. Um, the discover question is, is a bit strange because there are different products. So like discover is personalized based on your, what Google account you're logged into and you have to like go to discover, or go to your Google, you know, search 
bar and like kind of scroll down to see your discover feed. So I don't exactly know how SGE would be impacted by that. Um, I know that they're they're doing some more to like with discover, like you'll sometimes get like, it recommends that you do a certain search query and then it takes you over to Google because at the end of the day, they're trying to drive you back to Google search. Um, so maybe there, but like SGEs generally opt in unless I'm missing something. Like you have to like search for something to see SGE. Um, but there is actually, if you're, if you're on the Google app on your phone, there's these new like SGE peripheral products. Like there's uh, what's it called? SGE while browsing where Google's trying to summarize the page using AI. So sometimes if you're on a, an article that you clicked on from discover, you'll see that option to like use Google's new AI products to summarize what you're seeing. Right. And then on the uh, tracking side, when I spoke with Google about how are we going to track this, et cetera, et cetera, we, we need to know, it can't be another featured snippet play where you say, oh, feature snippets are great, but we're not going to share the data with you to tell you how great it is. Um, and now you're telling us the same thing with SGE, that SGE is going to be great for publishers. It's going to send you so much traffic. It's going to be amazing. And Google said, it's a beta right now. We're not going to go ahead and share that data right now. We're not going to put it in search console when it goes live fully. Maybe we'll consider it. Uh, but what shocked me was Bing. When Bing chat launched, Bing promised me they would include uh, Big Webmaster Tools, a way to see just Bing chat data, to see how many impressions you're getting. And when they launched it, first, they didn't launch it when they said it, what they would. And when they did launch it, they included Web and, B and Bing chat together. So you can't isolate or figure out how much Bing chat is sending versus Bing. And then when I spoke to Michael Schechter, one of the VPs at Bing Search, he's like, the way he worded it was like, overall net you're getting more traffic from bing because of bing chat and bing search together is sending you more clicks than it would otherwise i'm like that's a very more people use bing that. now <laughs> <laughs> um yeah right so i don't expect us to get any data from google um anytime soon around that and there's no way to really track it per se there were some weird parameters we were able to track for a little bit but google kind of stripped those out and it's hard to track and again, it's really beta. I mean, most people aren't clicking on stuff right now and it's very limited users because you have to opt into it. So they do have a point in that, but I don't think when it does go live that we'll get anything from Google Search Console or anything in analytics to track it better. Yeah, and, and I think the threshold, whenever I've asked anybody at Google that works on those teams, the threshold for how they update Google Search Console is does it make the internet a better place? I think Google always asks themselves two questions before they do something. One, will we make money from it? Two, will it make the internet a better place if we're not making money from it? And I don't think the answer to that is yes for either that, you know, on Google Search Console. So we probably won't see the data. Eventually they'll get around to it, but it's not important right away. So I think we're just going, it's going to be a black hole. Like whatever shows up in, in uh, SGE, we're not going to see. The other thing I would say to your first question, which no one wanted to answer <laughs> about how do you get into SGE? I don't think it matters. I think the idea of SGE is to answer the question and the reason, and I could be a conspiracy theorist here and I love to hear what Lily and Barry think, but I think the reason that Google gives those links is not so you click them, but so they can have plausible deniability on mm. plagiarism and harm. So imagine you typed into like search, like how do I make a bomb? And Google SGE gave you the answer to how to make a bomb. Now Google's legally liable, but if they say, oh, we got it from like how stuff works, or discovery, then Google can just say like, no, all we did was summarize what they did. And it goes mm -hmm. into, I forget what the law is, but like there's that law that Congress is always trying to like break. So then websites are liable for stuff, but like it, it as long as it falls into that safe Harbor, Google is not liable. Yep. Very interesting. Uh, I will, you, you brought up a good point. So earlier this year, uh, I was speaking and writing a lot about SGE and I kind of did some little experiments just on my personal website to see if I could influence what appears there. Turns out it's pretty easy to do so. Um, although also SGE has been getting better and better over time. So for a while it would like take some information that I put on my website and then get it slightly wrong and come up with these really hilarious answers. So like I've been tracking for like six months, I put a page, a, a little like FAQ on my website about, uh, what kind of dog I have and how old she is. She's a mini Australian sh shepherd and she just turned eight. So for a while SGE called her 76 years old and it was getting the breed slightly wrong, but like little by little, it got better over time. But for me, it turns out that just adding a content on i mean my site has a lot of links and stuff anyway so maybe it's like a reputable site but adding the content very very clearly answering the question very very clearly turns out to be sufficient to get yourself in there but having more sources that also answer things in the same way is a much stronger factor it's interesting because i i saw like really like obscure websites coming up 
that may have like someone even like have old content, mm-hmm. outdated content show up a lot in those boxes. Um, so not like, you know, the, the best cream of the crop type of stuff show up there. I mean, the Google said the stuff we're going to show there are the best types of sources, at least for my, my minimal testing on that. Um, also, I think more people are concerned about what SGE says about them or their brand or their CEOs and stuff like that than yeah. more about getting links because they just, it's more of like, they don't want SG to say something that's not either incorrect or just bad about them, um, which could happen. I think that's more of the, it's more of a reputation management concern than, oh, I'm going to, I want to make sure I get links there so people can click on me because most people think people are going to click on those links anyway. Um, and I do disagree agree with you uh, uh, about uh, Ellie, about uh, Eli, about um, they only care about money. I think that the, the team that works on Search Console is not driven by, will me, well, if we add this, will we make money? Um, I don't think the person who makes that decision actually is involved in that. I think it's more about they have limited amount of resources and will this make a difference to publishers to know? I think that's their bigger question. Um, we may disagree with them, but I really don't think it's a money thing. I mean, I met with the Search Console team many, many times. Um, no, they never bring up money at all. They could care less actually about money because these guys are the, the engineers that work at Google are spoiled brats, to be honest, and they get everything catered to them and they have no concept of you know, what about the concerns about having money and so forth, to be honest. Um, and I think the ad team is obsessed with it and some VP level, executive levels are obsessed with it. But I don't think the people working on, should we, you know, even the people who make decisions about having SGE in there really care that much about um, that. It's just like, oh, we have to do all these other things. What should we focus on adding SGE when it's just a beta or not? And I think that's the answer. Yeah, just to clarify, I'm not, I think the, the search console team's awesome and the engineers maybe they're not even spoiled brats. Just to get approval to fund that, I do think this has to be part of the equation. That was my that was my sentiment, that things get approved generally in Google if there's profitability or revenue around them. If there isn't, there has to be some sort of make the world better. And it's hard to really lobby that putting SGE results in the Search Console satisfies either of those. No, but I do think the Search Console team's awesome and they are working on a product for free for us. All right, I think one more question from the audience and then let's segue into some AI, BARD, you know, all that good stuff. But the last one is within this idea or world that we're we're moving into with SGE, what are the content formats that we think are going to be the most affected by SGE? You know, we're talking about like listicles, your money, your life, EEAT, you know, where where do we see SGE really making a big impact on what kinds of queries, what kinds of content? Eli, I'm going to select you to kick us off. I think standardized information, which is going back to our good friends at The Verge, anything that you're just like literally writing for SEO is the first thing I think gets impacted. And it really, anything that you know, you do a search result, let's say a health search result, like I have a headache, which is something that Google from a beta standpoint goes in and out on SGE, whether they give the answer, they do have a disclaimer at the top of SGE that says like, it's not medical advice. And if you're experiencing an emergency, call 911 to go to the ER. So they've covered themselves legally, but those kinds of things where you have like 10 results from just medical sites like Cleveland Clinic and WebMD and Healthline, that standard information, I think that easily gets disrupted. Other kinds of things that get disrupted, and I think this is interesting because there's a lot of SEO agencies that have cognitive dissonance on SGE, and they just want to say, business as usual, keep doing the regular things you're doing. Don't worry about this. Google's always saying they're doing things. They're not going to launch this. And some of the Fortune 50 and Fortune 500 companies use these agencies, and they don't know what's coming. So a company like Home Depot is an example. So for anyone ever that's ever done a home project and gotten stuck, like you unscrewed something and now you, you can't screw it back in, or you want to know how to like replace like a faucet, which terrible idea, always hire someone to replace a faucet if you have to get underneath it and it's leaking. But you go on, you go on Google and you search and you'll probably find an article from Home Depot, which tells you how to do all the things they do. That's Home Depot's content initiative. And somehow Home Depot thinks that if they tell you about like the three quarter inch screw, you're going to click the link and you're going to buy it from Home Depot instead of go to Amazon. That I think gets disrupted. That's exactly the kind of content where SGE can give you the results, play you the YouTube video, and then you go fix your faucet. So Home Depot, I don't think their revenues get impacted. Faucets are physical products. 
and they still need to be sold and fixed, but their traffic will get impacted. So if that's something they measure, they potentially are not aware. And there's many sites that are in this like content generation for traffic creation game, even though they sell physical products. And I, I think that's that's what I think is most at risk. Anything can really be distilled down into a simplified answer or a video played. I'd worry about if you're actually selling something again, like if you're Home Depot, I don't think the search results change. They're still going to, everyone still needs the physical things they sell. Maybe the results change. Maybe Amazon shows up first, maybe Lowe's shows up first, but the, that those things I think are, will be okay. It's, it's information, standardized information would be most at risk in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. I think it's, there's tiers of, um, I, at least for me, like how much are you willing to trust like a featured snippet or an SGE answer to sufficiently answer your question? Like to your point, Ela, like if I read that, I mean, granted, I'm not good at homeowner stuff, like, you know, like homeowner stuff, but basically like I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop at the SGE article and consider it like a, a sufficient, like enough answer to the question. I would probably want to go to one of the websites like a Home Depot and see the pictures, see the videos, see whatever, what other, other like elements they're adding to that content. So, and like the fact that Google SGE just started to dabble with recipes recently was a bit concerning to me because it's kind of the same for me. Like I don't cook very much, but I still think I would prefer to go to the recipe website as much as they have their own issues. Like, I don't want to take at face value what SGE is telling me to do. So if it's a math equation, sure. SGE, probably going to get it right, fine, whatever. So there's like certain answers that I think are sufficient and easy, but I think human nature and I think search, like the nature of searchers that we've seen for 25 years is they like to explore, they like to look at websites, they like to interact with who's writing the content and like get a deeper understanding. So yes, I think a lot of upper funnel traffic will get cut into by SGE, but I still think it's going to continue to be human nature to want to click on websites. Yeah, I'm not sure I have much to add there. I agree with everybody here. Same, same. I think that uh, to your point, Eli, it's, I think it's all about like history facts, right? There's this like degree of certainty around um, what Google thinks is, is relevant and important. And the closer, I think the closer that your answer is to, you know, 9900 100% of the content out there, you know, that's, that's the type of content that SGE will for sure replace. And we already see that replacement happening with featured snippets anyways. All right. Just to, I, I like Lily's last point about people like to click on, on results. And I think that's why you don't see TikTok and Instagram really upset search because it, it is like a one-to-one, -one, like this influencer said, buy this, but you don't have that whole like click around experience. So I, I think it cuts into it. Certainly like it disrupts some of the flow that usually goes through search engines, but you're not given that menu. And I, I think until TikTok has a menu of like, okay, I want to do, I want to fix a faucet and here's search results, just like Google. I don't think it disrupts Google until that point. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's move on to AI generated content in, in the SERP. Obviously large language models, GPT, you know, these are on the tips of lots of people's tongues. And to a certain degree, we've seen the rise and now cool off of people's limitations with AI content. The first question comes from Lee. Do we think that Google will eventually call out AI generated content in the SERP? And then I'll add a follow-up to that. You know, what are your ways of recommending the usage of large language models for content production? And how does that relate to, you know, the evolving ecosystem of what we know as helpful content update and everything else that's going on. I think if they haven't already called out AI content this year, they're not going to. And I, I was a bit surprised by that because I was like, come on guys, you gotta say something. Because if you don't say something, you're giving the entire industry like the green light, because this is what SEOs do. We take one little thing and we completely blow it out of proportion. And that's exactly what's been happening. Oh, Google said it's okay, so I can do this now. I can make 10,000 pages with ChatGPT and try to get them indexed every day. So I was surprised that they didn't do that already, but the fact that they didn't do that already tells me at least, and maybe, you, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but Google obviously has reasons why they can't say that AI content is good or bad. Maybe political reasons, maybe legal reasons, maybe because they are launching their own AI products. But 
I don't expect them to say anything more conclusive going forward. It's pretty clear they're talking in circles. This is helpful. This is not helpful. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when I spoke to Google about this, I was uh, we're having a conversation with Danny Sullivan back and forth. I'm like, seriously? You're seriously going to not do something? I mean, you're going to have like Panda escalated by, I don't know, four billion. Um, he's like, if we can handle Panda, if we did Panda, we can handle this. It's not a problem. Our algorithms will figure out what's good and what's bad. And if AI can create great, co great, good content, then great. Um, we'll deal with it. Um, so that's their stance is that we don't care who makes it as long as the content is good, um, then great. And they came up with this like who, where, why type of how type of content uh, thing, which kind of says, no, maybe AI can't do it. Uh, maybe you should describe that AI helped you write it. Um, personally, when I write and I write a lot, um and i tried to use some ai to help me write it just sounds weird it just sounds like i don't know like a lot of fluff to it which unnecessary fluff which can annoy readers um and it did make it more entertaining like the verge article was a lot of fluff and entertainment um but it just didn't get to the point until later or and kept messing things up so i don't know i mean i'm not sure i do think ai could do a could do a lot of what i do if it was just more toned down. Um, and I do think AI could do a good job, but I haven't been able to use AI to write my content, although I use AI for almost every single image I, I create now. It's been great to be able to make images that really are super technical and talk about a topic that no other image has ever been made for. Uh, Shutterstock was very limiting um, on that. And now I have a tool that I could go ahead and make a robot in a bathtub um, reading, a, reading a notebook while doing structured data, whatever it might be. You, you can't do that otherwise. So it's been, it's been great to uh, be able to use AI to, to create images, but I don't know about, AI, about content. And what's interesting is when it comes to images, Google has a you know, meta and structured data, meta text and structured data to actually define if, if that image is made by AI but they don't have the same thing for defining or, just, or declaring if, if content was written by AI yet. Um, so I find that interesting as well. Yeah, I think that what everyone forgets is prior to AI content was Fiverr and upper content. And that is way, way worse than AI content. Like you read some of this content, you're like, I, I don't even think that an adult wrote this content. So AI content is an improvement. And that that's probably why Google really doesn't come out and say, because I think their algorithms account for this either way. Doesn't matter whether it was written, you know, by a Fiverr person who wrote it for five dollars or whether it was written by AI and it was written for free. They and I think it's great. I can't wait till we talk about helpful content because Barry referenced Panda. Because I, I think helpful content is an iteration of Panda, which was their first algorithm where they looked at the quality of content. So that makes sense. And I haven't heard that from you, Barry, before. So that that's great. Um, the other thing, Barry, is is I, I do think AI can do the is it new thing for you. So you could just have AI be your brain and think through 20 years of Google changes, and then you could just have that respond. So you don't have to be bothered on Twitter. I want to see you do that. Go ahead and program it. I'm not an yeah. AI pro. I can barely do a chat GPT prompt. Not, <laughs> not my expertise. All right. Yes. Well, we have we have some questions then from the audience around, you know, more of this implementation of AI. Do we have any idea or thoughts on how, you know, Google or Bing detects AI, asks anonymous? And then I think the flip side of it is with the introduction of AI content, you know, we're entering this world of written content as a commodity. So what does the panel think about other factors that Google is likely going to be looking more at as a result of, you know, just this proliferation of content that, you know, we're seeing and, you know, what does that mean for this extra E that Google has introduced in their uh, thing? So what are y'all's thoughts on making sure that your content, now that you're producing it, it stands out within this world that we live in? Um, I guess I'll start. Um, yeah, I, I do think that Google is not really, like search engines are really not able to detect, AI. there have been a lot of tools that were released even by OpenAI to say, can we detect uh, AI uh, written content? And they removed that tool. Um, I think it's hard for them to detect that per se, because you could have people write in a way that's AI written and even typos, you go, we can figure out typos, but every word processor you use, every browser has built-in grammar and type of detections and fixes all that stuff. Um, 
so I, I don't think, you know, I don't think that there's, they're really so concerned about do we need to detect that it's AI. Although I spoke to different Googlers and they said, we're working on ways, the industry as a whole, including Google, is working on ways to detect AI. I think more for more of these deep fakes, like images and videos that are deep fakes, kind of that's like a real big concern, less, less of a concern with content, really. Um, what was the second part of the question was um how do you how do you then think about differentiating your content oh, right, in the this EAT stuff. yeah so I, I do agree with you know that is it new and could search search could ai write these things i mean why can't like i don't experience everything i write about but i take other people's experiences and put it down and convey it there in writing so i don't see why ai can't do that per se um I don't know why they can't. I, I do think there's an entertainment factor where I think Google's going to add another E, like a 30, where there can be more of an entertainment factor and say, can you entertain? Um, but yeah, I mean, Lily is the, the, the EAT expert here. So I think she should uh, take that. Yeah. Or I should mean, you uh, call yourself a thought leader? That's... Oh, no. That was like, <laughs> I can't. Sorry. Don't get me started. <laughs> don't get me started. Um, yes. So first of all, there's a tool called CopyLeaks. I don't know if Lee is on this webinar. Lee is awesome. He works for CopyLeaks. That's been, for in my experience, I think the best AI detection tool. It's actually, there's a Chrome uh, extension that you can add and you can literally just check content as you're reading it. Of course, all these tools are not 100% accurate, but in my experience, I, I think that that one's the most accurate. It's above my pay grade to explain exactly how it works, but you can read on their website. They have a lot of sophisticated technology that they're using. Um, and so that's been helpful. Even if it's not 100% accurate, I think <laughs> if it's showing repeatedly that something is detected as AI on a site, that's like whether or not it's AI, that might be cause for concern. Um, but yes, Barry, you, you raise a good point. Like the ability to use AI to do something helpful, like taking a lot of information and summarizing it or presenting it in, in new ways, I think is a great use case for it. I think where Google um, has shown already that it starts to crack down on things because a lot of the sites that were hit by the helpful content update, which I know that we'll talk about, are just taking data and information from other sites and rehashing it and just presenting it as if it's new. And those site owners will tell you it is new. Like that, that wasn't ever presented that way before, but from Google's perspective, you just found a quick way to take other people's information and basically monetize that. So it's a really tricky thing, right? Because with AI, if we're going to be finding more and more solutions for just creating content with less effort. And what I think Google and its users have repeatedly raised is that we like to see that something is from another human being. And we like the experience of reading content that we know is actually written by a person. So I don't see why it matters if it's AI content. Like my wife actually, my wife's a teacher and in her school, she doesn't care if it, people are using AI because if you, whatever you've assigned to students can just be replicated by AI, then the assignment was dumb, right? Like this is, this is the way of the future. So if you're asking someone to write a thousand words on a topic because it's a thousand words and there's a tool for doing that, then the assignment should be more thoughtful and should be harder and should be a way to you incorporate that tool so you've actually learned something and gained something. And I think that's probably Google's perspective too, which is it doesn't really matter who and how the content was written. We don't need to detect it. If it does the job it's supposed to do, then it doesn't matter again, whether it's written by Fiverr or whether it's written by a human or whether it's written by AI. And not to just like keep going back to the, the alligator article, but that article could never have been written by AI. It was entertaining. It had to gather that interviewer had to gather interviews and to gather data. And that that's the threshold. And we're humans, we're consuming that. If we it doesn't, even if that had been written, written by AI, but it was entertaining, we wouldn't have cared. So I don't know. Will we ever see Oscar winning movies created by AI? Potentially, but there's going to, it's not going to be a single prompt of like, write me a Western that like lasts two hours and has like, I don't know, John Wayne in it. So that's not going to happen. It has to be more complex and it's different than just put together a thousand words. So I, I think that's the thing Google's looking for. And Google's always trying to replicate what humans want. I, I always think of Google as a curator or a librarian or like your perfect, you know, it's your perfect curator. So they're looking for some sort and they're, they're using their own AI to understand what humans want and what humans are interested in. So that's the threshold. So don't focus on like, how do you sneak something past the search engine, but like, how do you sneak something past humans and the search engine will comply. Totally. And I think that this, this is a good segue into the helpful content updates, right? We see a very big shakeup across a variety of different verticals that I think Lily has called out. Things like travel blogs being really affected by the HCU. 
first off, you know, what are what what do y'all think are the biggest contributing factors to what HCU version two, you know, that just finished releasing? Uh, what were the factors that you know you've seen be what Google has been penalizing? Lily, I think <laughs> this is a good a good question. Yeah, for you. Uh, my team and I have been doing many helpful content update audits for clients over the last few weeks, which has been very illuminating. And we've also just been looking at hundreds of affected websites. I've I've shared this on Twitter a few times. X, sorry, whatever. Um, I think that this is to me. I don't know about you guys, but this is the one of the most clear Google updates I've ever seen. Like the Penguin and Panda updates were pretty clear. Obviously, Penguin was very, very clear with Google, what Google was trying to do, but um, Medic was somewhat clear. This to me is the most clear because like I've never seen a situation where so many of the impacted sites have the same exact attributes across the board. Um, of course, there's exceptions, there's whatever, but like generally speaking, hate to say it, sorry, just the messenger, don't shoot the messenger. Uh, it's niche affiliate websites that have affiliate links and ads all over the place and have Mediavine or Ezoic or whatever and have some type of niche blogging expertise where they talk about travel blogging or whatever the case may be and churn out lots and lots of content. In many cases, they write 10 articles a day. They quote unquote write 10 art articles a day. Um, in many cases, the authors don't exist. Uh, in many cases, the website is just a website without any brand presence at all. Um, and of, of course, because it seems that Google really cracked down with this version of the helpful content update, um, a lot of sites that were actually genuinely doing things right, or like actually travel blogging or actually reviewing products got hit. So that sucks. And we're hearing a lot of that, but I think that's absolutely what Google was going after. And if your site demonstrates those patterns, we've seen some sites that like got caught in the crossfire because they probably were using too much SEO content, too many SEO optimized headlines, things like this. You have to like kind of break free because Google's using machine learning. So just get yourself in a position where you're not being classified as an unhelpful website. Yeah, I uh, totally agree with that. Um, and it's funny because we, we all, I think all of us in the SEO community felt like the first helpful content update would be this, what we saw with the September one, right? September, yeah. Um, and we were shocked when it went live and it was like, that was weak. I mean, it wasn't as big as we all thought it would be. We thought it would be like a panda or penguin style type of update that shook the industry, the SEO industry specifically, significantly. And we waited for a few updates, or uh, I think of the third one, is the third one, I forgot to count. Uh, whatever happened in the September update, that was what we expected to happen with the first one. Um, and I think we just got too comfortable. Uh, we got too comfortable when, you know, the Florida update hit in 2003. We got too comfortable when the Panda and Penguin update hit. We got too comfortable with these core updates um, initially, which called Phantom or Medic or whatever. Um, and now Google shook us again with this this new helpful content update. Um, and there'll be more. So again, you know, we we as SEOs often like to take shortcuts or go through a checklist of stuff that we need to do in order to go ahead and write good content. But often it's not about going through that checklist. More as often than not, it's just writing how the Verge wrote and just going ahead and upsetting a lot of people and writing in a good way. Uh, but really speaking your truth. She definitely spoke her truth. She believed that when she wrote that. Um, we, not, we, not, we might not you know, agree with her, uh, but you know, you need to go ahead and do your research and write well and write in a way that people want to, to read. Although I don't doubt most people read that whole 8,000 word article. But I do agree. I do agree with like, you know, there are, there's always collateral damage. Um, if you got hit and I, my site has been hit at least by two updates, like a Panda update and some pre updates before Panda. Um, and I think by a core update as well. And I just stayed true to what my readers, I think my readers want. And ultimately, you know, I recovered and um, I'm making a fortune of money on, my, on people clicking on my ads on my website. And I'm just joking. I, I make almost nothing, um, but I enjoy what I write and, um, and it ranks okay. Not better than some other sites, but you know, again, just do it because you love it and because you know it better than other, other people. And I think ultimately you'll be fine um, with these updates going forward. I, I think that most sites and Lily would have more data than me on this, but I think most sites that get hit by helpful content updates or any sort of update like this, that's looking for quality of content they were trying to do SEO. I would imagine that if you didn't measure your SEO traffic and you were just doing your thing, you're unlikely to fall into any sort of helpful content update. But I think it's when you're trying to do SEO, and I find this all the time with clients and potential clients, where they're like, I'm doing this for SEO. I'm like, what about for users? They're like, well, we don't really just 
users don't look for this. So I think it's when they they're leaning too far in Google's looking for these things and, you know, AI, I mean, look, Google can write AI content. They can recognize AI content. They can, they can use machine learning to see whether it's useful for users. We know that they were looking at click-through rates on search results. So these are the things they're looking for. So the things that you thought that you were going to sneak by Google, they're reminding you that you can't. And I think, you know, Panda was the first version of this and was in uh, 2011. Barry would know the exact minute it rolled out. But when they rolled it out, then they, so it was an update and then they baked it into the full algorithm and things like helpful content updates are just catch-ups. It's the things that didn't get caught by the algorithm ranking the site to begin with. And they're just doing a refresh to like clean out things that never really should have ranked to begin with. I see uh, it. I, I think you're totally right. I do see it uh, somewhat differently because I think this is just my opinion. I think that um, in the last, let's say two to three years, there's been a surge of new SEO approaches. They aren't exactly new, of course, but there's a lot of people shouting a lot of tips and tricks about how to do SEO. And now we have AI tools as well. I think the problem is becoming exponentially worse. So I think it took Google a while to create a ranking system and a ranking system update that addresses what a lot of these people have been doing and actually doing very successfully with seeing a lot of SEO traffic in the last couple of years. I'm going to ask one final question, and then I think we should go into rapid fire mode where we all like call out the specific panelists and, you know, I think your areas of expertise. And if you could provide one to two sentences in terms of a response, I think that would be great. So I think there are a lot of people who you know, we're practicing SEO and may have been purposefully or accidentally punished by the helpful content update. I think as the dust is starting to settle, there are a lot of questions of, okay, I've gotten this like, you know, site-wide penalty that's been applied to, to my domain. I'm cleaning up, right? I'm add, adding author bios. I'm making my content entertaining and, you know, trustworthy, but what does the reconsideration look like? You know, what is the panel seeing in terms of sites that have been decimated and what are, what are the, the steps to recovery? I think it's, a, it's still too early to respond specifically to the most recent helpful content update. Unfortunately, a lot of people are like, okay, well now what, you know, it's like, if it's anything like Google updates and ranking systems and core updates of the past, it takes a really long time, sorry to say. Long time, a lot of hard work. Um, we've worked with sites where it takes a year or two years to start to see a significant recovery. And that's because Google takes a really long time to process things. It also takes a really long time to do the work properly. So sorry to say you probably won't see 60, 70, 80% increases in traffic overnight when you start to make the changes. And Google says this in its documentation, it's gonna take us a while to process everything, but um, keep chipping away, doing the right thing. You'll probably start to see traffic gradually coming back. But as Google literally says in its documentation, you have to wait for another helpful content update to roll out to see a significant recovery. It's interesting on that point, because core updates were clearly like, you have to wait. This one, they made a point to say with helpful content update, Google updates their scores constantly here, but there's some type of timeout period, I think they said, a validation yeah. period where it could take several months for Google to trust that your changes or actually changes that you're doing to help people as opposed to just changes you're making just to rank better. Um, so it's kind of like the old, I don't remember anybody here remembers the sandbox, the Google sandbox stories. Totally different, but it's kind of Google's putting you in this penalty box where you have to like wait a little bit and they have to see, oh, is your content being updated for a week or two? Or are you going to update your content over the next three months or so to make sure that the content is really being designed in a helpful way? Um, so it seems like the scores themselves is interesting they run them in real time whereas like panda and core updates they seem they're less like they're more when they do some type of refresh of the data and then push it out then it just it's hard to know i mean because obviously core updates have changed a lot panda is no longer existent um but these algorithms change and they're more real time although you don't see the impact in real time because google puts you in this type of what we call timeout period i think it's super interesting so if I could put a name on this, I know Google always says they don't have a domain authority, but there there is some sort of authority given to every single website. They have to know like which is like a governmental website, which is a, a you know a trusted media site. I think this is negative authority. So that's they're just applying that flag to it. So even if you're doing all the right stuff, you have to earn past that negative authority. 
And again, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, page rank is a part of the algorithm. So John Mueller always says there's no domain authority, but there's some sort of brand that is attached to something. And when you do a move, let's say you move from one website to another, you're bringing that brand with you. You don't need to start from scratch. So I, I think that's the way they're applying this is from an algorithmic standpoint, it's some sort of negative flag, which is why, like Lily's saying, you do all this good stuff. It doesn't really matter because the negative flag has to fall away. Awesome. All right. Well, let's quickly move into some round of rapid fire. I'm going to call out the question, call out the panelists that I think can best address it. And then if you could just give a couple sentences on the response, I think we can get through a good chunk of the questions, but probably not all of them. So Eli, Tim asks, based on recent core updates, what do you think are the top strategies for B2B SEO? I always say this and then I get flamed for it, but I don't think most B2B sites should bother doing SEO. Like if you look at the <laughs> way your, your acquisition happens, it usually doesn't happen directly from, for many, many products. It doesn't happen directly from search results. Usually your best customers are going to come from demand gen. So I think the best strategy for B2B SEO is to answer the questions about your software that people might not, might be looking for when they search and not to just focus on keywords, but really to focus on the buyer and the use case. Great. Lily, Andrew asks, should news publishers prioritize building forums to increase engagement and user-generated content? We're also seeing mm -hmm. a big increase in author profile visits over the last four months. How important is all of this? Great question. Um, building forums is a topic way above and beyond SEO implications. So like, I think, yes, if you can manage it, which is the hardest part, for sure have a forum. But that's like, a lot to manage and people tend to get really wild in forums and it can create a lot of SEO issues if you have people leaving um, profane commentary or anything like that. So yes, if you can manage it, do it. I think like the trip advisors of the world see a lot of success with that type of strategy, um, but be very careful. And what was the second question? Sorry. It was with forums and user-generated content or was yeah. that the author bios? Oh, author bios, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, so um, I'm also seeing this as well. If you have a reputable author, let's say if you have like a, an influencer or someone that is very popular on, let's say, TikTok or YouTube, and that person writes content for your site, which by the way, do that. That's a really great SEO strategy. Um, a lot of people will search for that person and you'll see a lot of people hitting the author bio page. I'm seeing more and more of this. Google's doing a lot more to highlight individual authors. So yes, keep chipping away at your author profiles and make them like a personal mini site for the people that write for your sites. It's a good strategy. All right, Barry, Calvin asks, and I know you reported on this whole thing, after the whole bank rate saga, is it advisable to still disclose the usage of AI for content that was partially assisted by AI? And what are your thoughts on that? I'm sorry, which saga you cut out for a second? The bank, bank rate. Oh, um, yeah, I think always disclose um, if you're going to use AI just because your, your reader is the most important thing. If you're tricking readers to thinking that you know, a real person wrote it and then it comes out that AI wrote it and readers don't trust you anymore. I think ultimately you're hurting your readership and that's more important than, you know, you know, it's more important than your, your rankings because ultimately direct traffic is super important. You know, if I lost, you know, I've been hit by penalties multiple times over the past 20 years for my website. Honestly, I have a huge readership. They come to my website by going there directly on a bookmark every single day. I get tons of traffic from direct, uh, from stat and that's the most important thing you don't want to alienate your users uh, because somehow google is able to figure that out one way or another awesome well we're right at the hour i know we couldn't get around to answering everyone's questions before i give everybody back the rest of their day wanted to do a very big thanks to our panelists we had an awesome round of questions a lot of awesome insights to share so if you want to follow them, I've put their social media profile within the, the chat. And just a quick shout out, Lily is an SEO professional. She also currently serves as the Senior Director of SEO and Organic Research at AMSIB, formerly at Path Interactive. Barry has been around in the search space forever. He's a contributing editor to Search Engine Land, owns Rusty Brick, a New York-based web consulting firm, and runs Search Engine Roundtable very popular blog. Eli is the author of Product-Led SEO, an SEO consultant for clients like Shutterstock, Gusto, WordPress, and Quora. 
So that's a wrap. Thank you so much. And I hope that everybody's learned quite a lot about SEO and what's been going on. Any Thanks last everyone. words from our panelists? Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, y'all.